Good evening, everyone. Thank you all for attending our In Conversation with Julia Henderson event as she presents her wonderful debut book, The Funny Thing About Norman Foreman. My name is Suzanne and I'm one of the librarians from City of Parramatta Libraries. Uh, I'm currently on the lands of the Darrow people, but wherever we are in Sydney, we are meeting on land that always was and always will be Aboriginal land. And I would like to pay my respects to elders past, present and emerging. So Julieta Henderson grew up in the rainforests of North Queensland and developed her passion for the written word, producing magazines for school friends and neighbours with her sister. She has worked her way through jobs as diverse as bicycle tour guide in Tuscany, nanny in the Italian Alps and breakfast waitress in the wilds of Scotland. Like many Australians, her love affair with Europe began when she came to London and stayed for more than a decade. Now a full-time writer, Julia divides her time between Melbourne, the UK, and wherever else she can find for winter. So welcome, Julieta. Thank you, Suzanne. It's lovely to be here. Oh, well, first off, I just want to say I loved your book. It was wonderful. Uh, such an uplifting read, I think. Did you mean to write a, a uplit when you started? Actually, I had never even heard the term uplit until... I was told that by my publisher that that was the genre I was writing in. But I did always intend to write a book um, with a, not necessarily, I don't necessarily need a happy ending, but I always like to read books that have some kind of a message of hope or something like that in them. And I always knew that that was the sort of book I was going to write myself. So uh, where did the inspiration for this book come from? Did you have the characters spring to life or the storyline came first? Um, the characters definitely came first in this case. Um, I, I don't think I actually woke up one day and there they were in, in bed with me or anything, but I definitely woke up one day and they were in my head. They were fully formed. Um, I, I knew them straight away, it seemed. And then it wasn't till after I, I figured out who Norman and Sadie were that the storyline came and really... Um, the inspiration behind the plot or behind the story of the book sort of came from a question that I, I've always been interested in the, in the parallels between or the relationship between comedy and not necessarily tragedy, but sometimes tragedy, but comedy and sadness, because I think there's a, there's a, there's a really fine line in between them. And what I asked myself when I sat down to write Norman's story was what if the worst possible thing that could ever happen in your life actually led you to the best time of your life. And that started me off or started Norman and Sadie off on their journey. And what a journey it was. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Especially uh, the finding father part, I found, I found very intriguing trying to determine the father of uh, poor Norman and, and who it might be. But at least we find out by the end, which I like. I like the fact that it wasn't a closed door mystery. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> Open door, sorry. <laughs> so I found Jax a really cheeky and filled with life character, especially for one um, who's died. And it's such a contrast to Norman, who's the boy with gravitas or a bit of an old soul. So did you always mean for them to be complete opposites? Yeah, I did actually. And I always meant for Jax to be um, a really big part of the story, even though he was, as you said, I mean, it's no spoiler to say he I don't think it says it on the back anyway. Um, but, yeah, it, but because I think opposites do attract in friendships. I mean, I think we've all got a friend who's the complete opposite to us and shouldn't really be our friend, but for some reason we just love them to bits and, or they love us to bits, <laughs> depending on which way you look at it. Um, so I did consciously want them to be very different because uh, they bring different things to the story, number one, but in a sense of their own story, they bring so much to each other, Norman and Jax. I mean, Norman's a little straighty 180 type of guy and Jax is a really naughty kid. And um, I just think it's nice that they sort of can play off each other. Yeah, definitely, definitely. And uh, Jax, he always said, one really and truly best friend is a hundred times better than having a whole bunch that aren't quite sure. So is that a lesson that you've learned in your life regarding friendships? Oh, absolutely. I think we'd all say that. I mean, you know, the people that you meet throughout your life, you can always, you can always do with more friends and you can always, you know, new friends can be just as dear and as lovely as old friends, but, but there's kind of nothing like having the friends that have known you through thick and thin and known you, you know, since, even since you were a child or, or through bad things. And, and I think that it's, it's, it's much nicer and more valuable in your life to surround yourself with 
a group of real friends than just have everyone love you and all pretend to love you and you know thousands of them and ticking them off like on a Facebook page or Instagram I don't think in real life it's it's very rewarding to just collect friends for the sake of it no definitely I completely agree there's nothing like a true friend rather than yeah, yeah the likes or that kind of thing yeah. definitely and I think their friendship is just such a pivotal plot of the story that it kind of takes off on a life of its own. Yeah, and it's really lovely because, you know, I think we all see, I don't have kids myself, but I think when you see you, you see young people's friendships, it's really nice to see how caring they can be towards each other. You know, you think, oh, they're just kids. They might forget each other after a while. But I think it's really nice. And, you know, if if even if Jax can't be with Norman as a lifelong friend, he's always going to be there in some way, shape or form. Exactly. And he does, it does, he does kind of take, you, even though you'd never meet him alive, you kind of seem like you do, both yeah. because of how well he's described and, and how well uh, Sadie and Norman think about him. And I love the bit of where he said, beat first, break the door down and damn the consequences, was used to describe Jax's approach to life. Uh, which I think we can all try and emulate at some stage, but does this reflect your approach as well? Oh, God, no, <laughs> definitely not. I'm very, I mean, I, I, I can do small spon spontaneous things, but no, I'm definitely, I, I like to think about things before I do them. And I think that's the joy of being a writer. I mean, that's probably one of the best things about being a writer is you can live through your characters and you can do certain things that we have them do certain things that you would never do yourself. And so you kind of get a little bit of, naughty joy out of that as well but no definitely not I'm I'm not a Jack's character I'm a, I'm a goody goody. <laughs> would you say you're more of a Norman character? Uh, um, actually yeah yeah I think I would be sort of a bit um, you know a bit of a hopefully a quiet achiever but a, a little bit more on the quiet side and not not showy. Yeah. So is that where the um, Jack's approach to life where the open mic uh, comedy idea came from is this something that you wish you might want to do or have you done it oh never never and never would I in a million years um I look I, I think anyone who does open mic nights because I've been to quite a lot I am a, a really big comedy fan and I've been to quite a lot of open night open mic nights myself and it's oh it, it can be so heartbreaking because it's pretty tough any crowd is a tough crowd and um, I think I can't remember who it was, but there was a comedian that said something and it's always stayed with me is that being a stand up comedian is is one of the hardest jobs in the world, because basically you're getting up there in front of a room full of people and saying, I'm the funniest guy in the room and then you have to go and prove it. So I, I would never, ever put myself through that and try and prove that. <laughs> I'll leave that to Jackson Norman. Yes, me too. Completely agree. And there are many first rules of comedy mentioned in the book that can often be used for life itself, I think. So how did you come up with these? Oh, there were so many more first rules of comedy to start off with. I, I think I wrote about, oh, I think I probably wrote about 25 or 30 first rules of comedy. And because obviously that's a, you know, it's a bit of a joke because they're, they're all the first rules of comedy. But what I did, when I had to sort of, um, there was a bit of, it was about 50-50 as to whether I was writing the chapters to fit the, the rule of comedy or writing or, or squeezing, sort of crowbarring the, the rule of comedy into the chapter. But there was quite a lot of work done there because I had to make sure that it was relevant to, I mean, it's only sort of a, a throwaway line at the beginning of each chapter of Norman's chapters, but um, it was really important to me that it had to mean something as well. And there's a little story that progresses through those first rules of comedy. So it took me a while. There's many, many more. I could write a sequel with the other rules of the next rules of comedy. But um, I think the ones that I ended up with, are as, exactly as you said, there's, there's a lot of metaphorical rules for life in there as well. I think you can apply them in, in many different situations. Definitely. And you know what? Sequel is not a bad idea, by the way, to say <laughs> Or if you perhaps would like to publish some of these uh, unpublished uh, rules, of rules, rules of comedy for us all, I'm sure we would all appreciate them because I do, I like, I like them when, when books have that little, you know, quirky sentence or quirky thing at the beginning and then there's a tie-in to the chapter. I think, uh, yeah, I think it's a good idea. I think it's a great idea. Yeah, and it's really fun to do as well because it really makes you think. You know, when I decided to do that, which was pretty much right from the beginning, 
that's probably one of the things that is structurally in the book that I had to think the most about. And it was quite fun to, to come up with all these rules of comedy because a lot of them are sort of, you know, I'm not sure there's anything original in life anymore, but a lot of them are sort of remakes of certain sayings. And I, you know, I did a lot of research on um, comedians and what, what they thought were important things. So yeah, there's a lot of work gone into those for little throwaway lines. So it's, it's good that you notice them. It's good that you like them. <laughs> Yeah, no, they were great. So what are uh, you saying you're a fan of comedians? So are there any top, like your top three comedians that you would always love to watch? Oh, yeah, definitely. Except I don't know about top three, top three. <laughs> but my all time favourite, I mean, you know, there's a lot of clues in the book because of all <laughs> Norman's favourites are all my favourites. But my top three would be Dave Allen would be the first for sure. Um, Bob Mortimer who is part of the Reeves and Mortimer, who people might remember. I mean, he's still around. He's got the best Twitter account in the world. So if anyone wants to get onto that. Um, and the third would probably be someone more recent, which probably most people would know, which would be um, Michael McIntyre. All British comedians. I'm sorry to the Aussies, but there's plenty of Aussies in there in the top 10. But, you know, they're my top three. I'm sorry. <laughs> No, I think I might agree with you there. I, I must admit, I'm more a bit more familiar with the Australian ones, but now you've given me some um, inspiration. Every time I came across a name, I'm going, right, okay, must put that in my list to look up. Yeah, yeah and that's really nice to know. And there was a lady that I spoke to last night and she said, she said, oh, I love this book so much because it really made me go back. She said, I spent the rest of the night um, Googling old Dave Allen um, videos because Dave Allen is, he's, you know, he's gone now. He's not with us anymore. But anyone over probably... You, know, you probably have to be over 40 to, you know, to have him at the front of your memory, but you might remember him if you Google him and go, oh, that guy. But he is just, he's brilliant. He's, he's fantastic. And that's what, and, and Norman idolises him and that's who he would love to be. Yeah, I can picture him as a grown-up one. Yeah. yeah. Oh, and speaking of poor Norman, his battle, and I think it's pretty safe to say it was a battle, with chronic psoriasis is often mentioned in the book and in such a way it's almost like another side character I think so where did that come from is it your personal experience just you just wanted him to have to battle or something or it, I just feel so sorry for him yeah I know and look I have to admit a lot of it was to I wanted to give that poor kid as many challenges as I possibly could um, and that is a great challenge added to all the rest of his challenges I don't have personal experience with psoriasis myself. I do have many bad skin issues. It's not psoriasis, but it comes and goes. It's allergies and things like that. So I kind of, I knew to a certain extent, but nothing like that. But um, I have known people with uh, one person in particular with really, really bad psoriasis. And there was, you know, certain, certain times when I was out with her in public and I saw how people looked at her and how she felt about it. And so I had a little bit of an insight, not a huge one, but um, so just through her. But then I did a lot of research because I wanted to make sure I didn't want to necessarily get medical about the whole thing, um, but I wanted to make sure that I could uh, sort of depict that in a realistic but sensitive way that that some people would be able to um, relate to. Yeah, well, definitely. I was going, I, all I kept thinking of is I would hate to have that. And he, he's such a, he reminds me of like an Aussie battler, even though he's British. <laughs> he is a bit of a battler, actually, poor old woman. I mean, that, and again, that's what being a writer is about, is about, you know, putting your character, someone said, put, it, put your character in a tree and throw rocks at them. And that's kind of what you do. But um, yeah, poor Norman, but he he's, you know, he he's up to the job. <laughs> yeah, very sweet boy, I think. Yeah. So your writing uh, style, it's uh, so descriptive, even for sad and tense situations, there's uh, an element of humour about them that lightens the scene and makes the reader think, yes, that's exactly how it feels. I would might never have said it like that, but precisely how it feels. And I, one of them that springs to mind is uh, Sadie, Norman's mum, thinking she wished she could hug the sadness out of someone, squeeze and squeals until it pops out like a pimple. <laughs> and all that's left is for time to do its work and heal it over. So do you often try and find the lighter sides of situations, especially in the midst of tragedy? 
Um, I think I do for myself. Like I think uh, um, it's it's quite healthy to try and find something light if you're having a really, if you're in a bad situation. I don't think I'd presume to do it for other people though. I think you have to be led by them because I wouldn't want to, you know, have someone have something terrible happen to them and come in with a joke on the side and, you know, no one. So I wouldn't do it in that case. I think I can do it in a book. And, but yes, definitely um, personally, I think it really does help if you try and find at least some humour. Um, even if there's no humour to be found in the situation, if you go away and watch something funny or, um, you know, have, think of some funny memories or something like that, someone tripping over something, <laughs> I don't know. But, yeah, so more personally, but, no, I, I don't think I would presume to do it for other people. No, fair enough. And I think especially during this, this past year, I think we could all... Uh, enjoy looking at the lighter side of life and I remember Australia's Funniest Home Videos that was always a really popular show I know <laughs> and I, I can just picture Jackson Norman doing something for that and it would be hilarious <laughs> that's true actually and it is funny I mean that's sort of and I think they I mean there's a, a few thing, comments in the book about that like it's sort of that they were obsessed with the old time comedians not like the the, you know, the, the sort of more risque humour that, that goes on today, but they were, that was their uniqueness was they were young kids and they were really into these old style comedians, but that old slapstick comedy is, oh, I love it. I think it can be hilarious. You know? Yeah, I think we all have a bit fond, of mem fond memories of that kind of, of comedy. Uh, Sadie, so Sadie is very, very hard on herself in the book, I think. She's always, you know, thinks she's a bad mother and she's not doing everything that she can help but I don't see that myself but she's very hard on herself where did where did this come from um yes you're right she's very hard on herself and I think as I said before I'm not a mum but I've been around enough mums and surrounded by you know friends and, and family to know that mothers always have that that battle that in internal battle of whether they're doing the right thing, whether they're doing mothering right, whether they're being the best person that they can, the best example that they can be for their child. And so I, that, that's why I wanted to put that in. And, I, and But in reality, you know, Sadie thinks she's a hopeless case and she's, you know, to a certain extent, she's done some interesting things and she lives her life a certain way. But to Norman, she's actually his absolute hero. So um, that was part of why... I wanted to make her character a little bit self-deprecating or a lot because I wanted to show really that no matter how bad she thought she was, in Norman's eyes, she was everything. Yeah, it was such a sweet relationship, her and, um, yeah. her and Norman. Just lovely. Yeah. And uh, she explains her risky behaviour after her father's death as a way to dilute the anger to something tolerable. So do you think this is a common way that you know, people can cope with, with that kind of thing, with tragedy or, or devastating news or something like that? Yeah, I think you only have to sort of look around to see that sometimes risky behaviour, I mean, her risky behaviour was risky morally, maybe not risky physically, although, but I think definitely that's a really good question because I think um, if you look around and you see people's behavior and things like that you know in a bad way it's often in response to something that's going on something bad that's going on in their own life and so unfortunately I don't think it's a really productive way of dealing with that sort of thing but it definitely happens and you know for Sadie whilst it was more morally risky than physically it was very emotionally dangerous for her that the, the way that she behaved. True but at least you know she got Norman out of it in the in the long run so I guess that's a you know, po total positive yes. and I think that's how she that's how she describes it as well so yeah 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 yes yeah. so I don't think she had any regrets to be honest <laughs> no well he's such a lovely little boy why why would you yeah <laughs> another really one of the other really great characters is Leonard the stereotype breaking older person character who loves modern technology and learning new skills and I think he here's who I want to be when I grow up. What about you? Oh, definitely. I love Leonard so much. And when people have asked me, I've had several people say, oh, you're going to do a sequel. And I mean, I don't think so. But 
there's this little part of me that hasn't quite finished with Leonard yet. No, he, he might pop up again because um, the story with Leonard is he, I've told this a few times and I, I don't want to sort of put Leonard down, but actually at the very beginning of the editing process, um, Leonard nearly got the chop because... Um, no, <laughs> no. <laughs> but because there was also another character um, when this story, or when I finished my first draft or millionth draft or whatever it was, um, there was actually another character which no one will ever know about except people, the few people that have read the first draft. Um, and my agent, it was my agent that said to me before it even got to an editor, she said, oh, you know, those two characters, so-and-so and so-and-so, -and -so, one of which was Leonard, um, they do they basically do the same or they, they play the same role in the, in the story. And she said, you know, it's quite distracting. You need to get rid of it. And she just sort of said, you know, I think you need to get rid of Leonard just because Leonard had a very small part. Like he was very small and the other character was a lot bigger. And so that was where she was coming from. And I tried so hard and I had many sleepless nights trying to think of how I could possibly get rid of, rid of Leonard. And in the end, I rang her and I was, you know, beside myself and I said, oh, I, I, I just don't know how, I, I don't know how I can do it. I love him. And she said, oh, that's fine. What about the other guy? And as soon as she said that, I was like, oh yeah, I could totally get rid of him and not even care, <laughs> which is not a very nice thing to say, but, but, but that's what happened. And so instead of getting the chop, Leonard had the reward of becoming a major character in the book and it was I love him to bits and you're exactly right that's exactly who I want to be when I'm in my mid-80s and I hope I am. No, thank goodness thank goodness you kept him because I don't think it would have been quite the same without him. I agree I agree and you know you probably in libraries you probably met Leonard on more than one occasion I'm sure because his characters like Leonard because he did a lot of his Again, no spoilers, but he did a lot of his courses and things at libraries and things. Yes, like he that. loved he loved the free adult education everywhere he could go. Cake decorating didn't matter what it was, which I find amazing, and I wish I had time to do that. <laughs> well, maybe when you're eighty, you've got a while to go yet. Yeah. <laughs> and I love his opinion that if you allow it, the universe provides you with exactly what you need at precisely the right time. I don't know if I completely agree with that. But it's a lovely thought. Where did that one come from? That came from Leonard because I'm not sure I entirely agree with that either. That was his. That was um, that was his little uh, view on life because he had had to be quite pragmatic. Again, no spoilers. Um, he had to be quite pragmatic in certain times of his life, and I think. I think it was. I just found it interesting to have an older character with that. You know, a bit new age kind of thinking that you know it, the law of attraction or the you know leave it up to the universe and the universe will do you right sort of thing um I do agree with that sentiment to a point but probably not as much as Leonard <laughs> no probably not but um I, I love the um it's not, uh, it kind of seems a little bit like an obsession with the red hibiscus tea and the way you described it was the crack cocaine of tea and it I'm thinking, okay, that sounds really amazing. And where can I get it in Australia? <laughs> I don't know that you can get it in Australia. You can. I looked it up. Oh, my gosh. Well, even I didn't know that. And I had it a long, long time ago. And it's something that I, I didn't forget it. I'm not huge on fruity flavoured teas, but I remembered that one. And I don't know where it, it was buried back there in somewhere in the back of my head. And when I wanted Leonard to that part of the story, just that little thing about his character, it just popped into my head. And then I, of course, I had to research that it was um, appropriate for when he first discovered his hibiscus tea and where he discovered it. And um, yeah, I mean, it's a tiny little detail. People are probably thinking, was this a book about tea? But um, it's a tiny little detail, but it's uh, it was important for him. And it, and it sort of gave him a point of reference that that you know with his wife and everything like that so yeah yeah that, I love that tie-in that was really good with the time yeah. with the wife and I, I just the uh, crack cane of tea come on you have you have to want to then research it because that's just such a great description I hope you didn't research that I don't know about you no no I didn't I didn't <laughs> definitely no. not that would have definitely um 
people would be going, what are you looking at? That came straight from me, I'm afraid, that crack cocaine of tea. <laughs> Not from Leonard. <laughs> Fair enough. Uh, um, Ten-year-olds making five-year plans, as Norman and Jax did when they were ten. Um, quite unusual. I don't know many ten-year-olds who would actually do that and then plan to stick to it. So were you one of these people? Such an interesting question. I don't think so. I mean, I'm always making plans. I don't think I would have known the or understood the concept of, you know, the five-year plan or the, you know, the modern concept of what are you going to be doing in five years and all that. Um, I am a plan maker to a certain extent, um, but I really liked, that was one of the things I wanted to, to sort of get across how serious Jax and Norman were about their comedy. And in fact, Sadie even says exactly what you said there. She said, you know, how many 10 year olds do you know that make a five year plan? Because she she didn't, she wasn't capable of doing that herself. Um, so yes, yeah, so it's very unusual. Uh, in answer to your question, I don't know any 10 year old who's made a five year plan, <laughs> except, for, except for my Norman and Jax. Um, but I'd be interested to hear from anyone if they've got 10 year olds and who have made plans like that. And it was a pretty ambitious plan. Very um, ambitious, my goodness. Yeah, but it was kind of nice because I, yeah, and I, I just wanted to show their commitment to, to their, their craft of learning comedy. Ah, we have an audience question which kind of ties into that. They were asking, do you have a formula for research? How did you go about it? And how do you know, but how did you know you knew enough to be able to sit down and write? Or do you perhaps write first and then research what you discover you need to know? Yes, the second bit. Um, I definitely don't have a formula. I mean, I don't know how I would have written this book before Google, to be honest. I don't know how anyone would do any research before, before Google. Um, no, and how I would write is, no, I definitely didn't do research separately. I mean, you know, it's not as exactly a historical novel or anything like that. So I didn't, I had to get things right and I had to make sure things were feasible. Um, but no, just when something would come into my head and I had to do stuff like the hibiscus tea or like the, um, you know, the Edinburgh Fringe, details about the Edinburgh Fringe and whether it was actually feasible that two kids could, could, get into the end but you know were, would be allowed to perform at the end of fringe things like that um so i just w did it as i went along uh which was a great time waster i probably could have done the book a lot quicker if i hadn't done so much research did you but go I, down the rabbit hole oh i went down a million rabbit wombat kangaroo holes everywhere it was it, but really good research and i still get um all the emails from the i i signed up as a participant for the um edinburgh fringe oh wow and because uh, that was a way to get all the information. Obviously, I was never going to be a participant. And I still get all this stuff that says, dear participant. And I go, oh, <laughs> if only. And so, so really interesting stuff that I found out about that. I've never actually attended the Edinburgh Fringe. That was going to be in 2020. So, Of course, of course. Maybe when you're 80. Maybe. Well, that's yeah. about, yeah, well, it's looking that way. But, um, you know, but places, but um, in terms of the research for, um the trip, I didn't need to do anything on that because I've done that trip virtually myself and I've been to all those places that I that are mentioned. Um, I did have to do things like check the distance was, um, you know, correct and you could do that in overnight or you could do it in four hours and I had to make sure that the four points that I chose were, you know, as random as I possibly could. So there was a lot of research going on there, but in terms of, um, you know, like Edinburgh itself and um, Bournemouth and, and everywhere really I've been to. So I, I, that was all in my head, in the back of my head. And not a lot of that comes out onto the page. I mean, it's not, it's not a geographic, geographical story sort of thing. And it's not a, you know, it's not a travel log about Edinburgh or Bournemouth or, or any of the other places, but because I know them, I think that allowed me to, 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 you know, get the, get the feeling of them across without having to give every, you know, street name and detail and stuff like that. Oh no, definitely. It it felt like you were you were in England, and you you could tell. So that that part of it was really really good, and I think it does probably help if you have had been there or had some experience with it. Yeah, and in fact, the book started the very beginning of the book. Actually, started when I was in Penzance. I stayed or just south of Penzance in a little tiny town called Mausel, which is the most beautiful place. And I'd gone there for three months to write 
not this book. It was a different book, which is still in the middle of my computer somewhere. But I fell in love with that area, as I think you couldn't possibly not, you know, that Cornwall area at the bottom of the UK. And just because that, that was where the story started, but it was where I literally typed, you know, once upon a time was there. So that's sort of very poetic, I think. So how long, uh, how long did the process take? Because this is your first book. So how long roughly did the process take from, I guess, from the ideas that you had, then the research, then I guess trying to get it published? Overall, how, how long do you think it's taken you? A long time. And and the getting published is the, which is, it's a bit of a, well, no, it's not necessarily a flip of everyone's story. Maybe everyone's got the same story. I just thought of that. The publishing part was the fastest for me. The writing, I started a long time ago. I mean, I started the book um, so when I was in Cornwall, so that's probably six years ago. And I just dipped in and out of it because, as I said, I was writing something else and also work and life and all the rest of it. Um, so I did dip in and out for a long time. But when I got serious about it and I decided that this was the story I was going to, you know, take all the way to the end, um, probably a couple of years in the writing. And then I was really lucky that I my search for an agent and publishing deal was very, very quick. Um, and if not- Very for, fortunate by the sounds of it. Yeah, yeah, it was, um, it's been a dream come true, to be honest. Um, but if not for COVID, the book actually would have been published in July, 2020. So it would have been even quicker than has, has been now, but because of COVID it's been, it was delayed a long time. Um, so in the time that, from, from when I finished it, to sending it to my agent. I then worked with her, um, well, she, she offered me representation. She was the first agent that I'd approached, which was amazing. She was my dream agent, is my dream agent still. Um, so I was extremely lucky and absolutely gobsmacked that I have been so lucky. And then I worked with her for a couple of months um, editorially at, um, before she then sent it off to publishers. And then it was a couple of weeks after that, I was offered my name. Wow, that's a, that's a process, but you're very lucky to get published because I've heard other authors who say that, oh, they had to do this and they had to do that. And so, yeah, yeah. Look, now, that, now that you know that, uh, you know, you've had some really good luck with that, uh, more books, I'm assuming, I'm hoping. Absolutely. Also, I have a two book contract. So, oh, yeah. Yes. <laughs> good, good, good. Definitely. But yeah, and, and on the subject of, of that, yes, it's, it is very, it, it can be heartbreakingly hard for an author to get an agent because that's basically what you have to do um, unless you're self-publishing. But if you want to be published traditionally, um, it's very, it, your first step is to get an agent and that is very hard. And then it, everyone who gets an agent doesn't necessarily get published. But what I say, what I have been saying to people who ask me is, that yes, I've, I've had an absolute, all my dreams have come true, but I did make very sure um, that I made it really easy for people to say yes to me at every step of the way, like even down to the, the you know, the point size of my font and the spacing of my query letters and the, you know, just being, just being spot on with everything that they want. So it was really, and, and also making sure that the book was as, polished as it possibly could be I, you know not thinking oh well I'll be working with an editor if I get a deal you know it was the, it was the best I could make it before I before I ever sent it out and I think that's pretty key for anyone who wants to get a book published is to number one finish it but number two don't rush it and just make sure that it's as good as it can be I mean it's not going to be that's not going to be the end of it you're then going to work with several other people um, and it'll then be better than you ever thought it could be. But it's a long process and I know it can be heartbreaking, but it's, you know, clearly it's doable. There's a lot of books out there. <laughs> well, that actually ties into another audience question that Catherine has, which is how many drafts did you write? You know what, when I hear, and I heard an author say it today, actually, so she said, well, this is, I'm on my third draft. I don't know because I could probably say hundreds because I didn't save I didn't say this is draft one, I'm finished, now I'm on to draft two. It, it, I'm more doing that now with my second one. Um, but with this one, I just kept on, it just kept on evolving. And there really is only saved copies of previous drafts 
since I got my publishing deal and started working with an editor. So there's no, so I, I really did one draft, but mm, my goodness, it took me a long time. <laughs> so many revisions, many editions. Revisions. Yeah. I didn't have it, yeah, but I didn't do them um, chronologically or anything like that. I was revising as I go and I'd go back and then I'd go forward and stuff. So really that one draft was probably equivalent to I don't know, 10, maybe, I, I really don't know, I can't, I can't say. But with the book that I'm writing now, I'm on draft two of it, uh, but draft one wasn't legible to anyone except for me. <laughs> Fair enough. Well, yeah. that's why it's a draft. Yeah, that's right. But draft two is would be legible to people if someone read it, but it's certainly not up to standard. So I imagine doing three or four, I guess. Did you ever have those middle of the night moments where you go, when you revisit a scene and going, oh, I've just got an idea to maybe make that better? All the time, all the time. And people have said to me, other authors have said, you think that's bad. Wait until you start thinking of ways you could improve your first book or the book that's already out there published. So I haven't been game to, I've listened to the audio book, but I haven't been game to, I've read this book so many times that uh, myself that yeah I'd hate to suddenly go oh I wish I'd changed that scene but definitely with as I'm writing now I have a notebook beside my bed and sometimes I have my laptop on the floor beside me and I'll jump up and, and try and write something but um, yeah they, they ideas come at all sorts of times very inconvenient a lot of them and you always think you're going to remember them but if well I think I'm going to remember them but I've learned now that even the simplest of things that I'll say, oh, of course I'm going to remember that because it's such a great idea. It's gone, gone forever. Ideas are fleeting. Someone famous said that. I don't know who it was. The ideas are fleeting and they so are. So for a writer, write them down. Yeah, that's fair enough. Post-it note by the side of the bed. Post-it note. I'm big on post-it notes like Norman. <laughs> I think uh, the picking, picking biscuit. Teeny tiny flucker and narfing, which is nasty laughing, great, great, great word, by the way, are just some of the unique language that you seem to use and very English seeming. Where did they come from? Did you just stumble across them? Did you make them up? Um, yeah, they came out of my head. The takes the pig in biscuit one is um, I've definitely heard people in the UK say that it's just a, you know, it's a pretend not swear word. But the other ones are... Um, you know, Jax was a bit of a naughty boy, but he he swore, but he also liked to play jokes on people, you know, with their perception and stuff. So that was where the teeny tiny flucker came in, um, which people will, that's not a spoiler either. You, well, it is a kind of a spoiler, but right. you'll, you'll, if you do read the book, you'll laugh now when you come across that. Um, and, uh, and the narfing, I just, in fact, that. Perfect word, perfect word. Great word. And there were, like the rules of comedy, there were, maybe I'll write a dictionary, there were many more of those, um, I can't remember what they're called, not a, not a compound noun, something, you know, a joining of two words to make one. Um, there were many more of those and Norman was originally going to do that a lot, but in the end, uh, they, they got edited out, but I probably still got them somewhere. But um, I just, uh, yeah, they just came from my warped imagination, really. <laughs> Oh, I think we're all a bit warped, aren't we, at the end of the day? Let's hope so. <laughs> Let's what, is, what is, uh, so this is another question, audience question. What is your advice for first-time authors in actually sitting down, starting to write a book? Was there a point you felt comfortable enough to say, I am writing a book? How did you know that this was the one you were going to finish? Okay, I'll start with the last bit of that question because that is so clear in my head and, and I know exactly what... The reason that I knew this was the one, I mean, I've got several that are half finished. I've got one that's completely finished. It's not really, but it's, you know, very draft one-y sort of thing. Um, it was when I, it, it was would have been harder for me to stop than to keep going. Like I, the motivation for me to finish this and to get Norman and Sadie's story out there and to, well, you know, to make their story and make their story come true, you know, their dreams come true. It was stronger than the motivation to stop or go and sit on the lounge and, you know, do stuff like that. So, and I think, you know, the it's a really well-worn piece of advice for for writing books. It's it's just just do it. And I think you can call yourself a writer or you can say you're writing a book from, 
the first word from you know once upon a time because if you've got that if you've got that intention to keep going don't you know no one can tell you that you're not going to and I think that's just it, it's so simple but it's the key it, it's just sit there and write it and don't expect perfection at all and um you know writing the first draft is terrible as I mentioned with you know just before the first draft's really telling yourself the story getting the story out from your head onto the paper or onto the keyboard and and I because I think a lot of people and I know I was um intimidated because you kind of expect that it's so good inside your head and you've got this great idea for a story and it's very intimidating to start typing away and go but that's not coming out the way it's in my head you know that's not that's not happening and I think you've just got to let go of that and just go I'm just putting it down doesn't matter you can even put like as I go I put oh do better like in brackets and or in capital letters better than this you know and lol and yuck and things like that and it's just literally getting the story out I mean you know it's really interesting when you get a book published even your first book immediately things are turned on their heads like I would be looking and I and I still do you never stop looking for good writing advice because everyone's got a different way of doing it but it's really interesting that the minute you get a book published people are asking you that question and the real only difference between someone who ends up with one of those and someone who hasn't yet is that that someone with a published book finished a book you know to start off with they finished it and then all the rest of the stuff on top of that is that's extra, that's cream. I mean, you shouldn't be writing to think, um, you know, I, I want to write so I can well, definitely not be rich and famous, but I, I can, you know, I don't even know how to put it, but you should be writing to get the story out of your head and in the first instance, and don't think beyond that. Don't think about agents. Don't think about who would be your ideal publisher. Don't think about even who's your ideal audience because you've got to write the book that's in you, the, the book that you would want to read. As I see a lot in, a lot of authors give that advice and they say, you know, write the book that you'd want to read. And I think that's the best advice you can get. And write for your characters as well. And that's ties back with what I first said, like it, if you're going to spend all that time with them and you get really invested in them. And that was what happened with this that made me just push through and get to the end was because I just fell in love with Norman and Sadie and Leonard and I just wanted them, you know, to do them justice. Well, I think you definitely did. And that's another audience type question. Uh, was it easier to find Sadie's inner voice or Norman's inner voice? Um, probably Sadie's. You know, they. I think with your first book, you can't, she's nothing like me whatsoever. But I've had a couple of friends say to me who have read it, like close friends say, all I could hear is your voice coming out of Sadie, which is interesting. Um, but I don't think you can help being a first time author. I don't think you can help putting yourself in some people in, in the character, some character. Um, Norman, because I'm not a mother, um, Norman's was probably harder, but because I knew him so well right from the start, um, it wasn't, that actually wasn't hard. The hardest part was to get the language right because I didn't want him to be, um, he's a very different sort of a kid but I didn't want him to necessarily talk like a, like your typical 10 year old, especially typical 10 year old British kid. Um, so I wanted to, there was a fine line between, you know, childish, immature talk and being too adult. So that was probably the hardest thing. Yeah. But I think, I think you did well with that because he does have those childish moments, but overall you can tell it's just because he's a serious kid that he talks like that. Yeah, yeah, I think so. And he's, I mean, you know, the way he is, his seriousness and his, you know, his, his, his seriousness is probably one of the most lovable things about him because he really cares about his mum and he cares about his job, you know, to, to sort of pay homage to, to Jacks and stuff. So, yeah, I think that was one of his more endearing traits. And to look after his mother always. Yeah, yeah, definitely, yeah. Oh, another audience question that we have is... Uh, how hard was it to switch between the points of view of the characters? Did you write all of Norman or Sadie at the same time and then inter interweave the narrative or did you switch between them while you were writing? So I did switch between them as I was writing. Um, 
I did try at one stage because I read some writing advice from someone that if you're writing from a dual um, point of views, that it's, you know, you should take all of those ones and write them and then take all of those ones and write them. And I did try that um, and it didn't work for me. Um, I think too, because the story, the plot is very linear, like they're on a road trip. So it's pretty clear what your next point is or what your next beat in the story is. Um, and it was so much easier for me to just do it as it came along. And I found it really easy to switch it. And when I was in one character, I was totally that character. I was I was there and then I could, and so, so I didn't have a favorite one. Like people have said to me, oh, which did you prefer writing, you know, Sadie or Norman? And I, I couldn't say, like they both to me were a joy to write. But how could you possibly pick? I know, I know, I won't, I refuse to. <laughs> Uh, so you're Australian, but have lived uh, and worked in many countries, especially the UK. So what made you decide to write your debut novel uh, in England instead of Australia? Uh, I loved my time in the UK. I've lived there for many, many years, back and forwards. Um, and as I said, this story did start in Penzance. Um, it just seemed like a natural thing to do because I'd started that story and I really wanted it to be a, a British story. Uh, my agent then is uh, British and my the, the first public publishing deal I got is in the UK. Ironically, it's still not out there because it's been delayed so many times. So it's out elsewhere before the UK. Um, that's really that's really strange. Yeah, yeah. It was always going to be, that's what, like it was last year. So it was supposed to be in July, but because of COVID, it's been delayed. And it was delayed here in Australia and um, South Africa and other places as well. But then it went ahead in January. And so now it's going to be the end of April um, in the UK and also a few other countries. Um, but yeah, I think there's, the British and the Australians are very similar. Like we're similar in our humour. We're similar in, well, obviously the same language. Um, and we're very similar lifestyles or aspirational lifestyles. I mean, obviously we've got the beach and it's beautiful and la la la. And so, so a lot of the British, you know, would love to be in Australia, but we, we're very similar, I think. And so I felt quite comfortable because I've lived there for so long. I, I did feel quite comfortable setting the novel over there. And also, obviously they were going to the fringe. I think it would have been a bit far for them to go from Australia, but, but um. Well, they could have maybe gone to the Melbourne Comedy Festival. Maybe, Melbourne Comedy, possibly. Yeah. <laughs> someone, maybe the sequel. Someone said that to me because um, my I grew up in Cairns in Queensland and someone said, yeah, you could have done a story of two boys travelling from Cairns to the Melbourne Comedy Festival. I said, yeah, I could have, <laughs> but I didn't. But, yeah, I think it's just because, we're, yeah, I, I do feel, I've always felt for the last, you know, 25 years that I've had one foot in, in both countries, so I feel very comfortable setting a novel there. Yeah. Oh, another um, audience question from Margaret. Did you write short stories and then progress to novels or are the two uh, styles too different to do that? Wow, that's the million dollar question because I have never written a short, oh, well, I probably have at school, but I've never written a short story in my life. And a couple of weeks ago um, for the publicity for the UK publication, I was asked to write a short story for a great magazine over there, which is, you know, it was really lovely to be asked. And so I had, a, but it took me about four days to write 600 words. It was a really short story. So that's like page and a half sort of thing. It was so hard. <laughs> it was so hard. And it's a totally different, it's, a, I had to Google how to write a short story because I was like, well, I don't know, how can I get from one place to another? It was, it was really, really hard. And I also had a theme that I had to work to. So it was probably one of the hardest things. It was harder than writing a whole book. So no, I think Margaret, it was, no, I didn't start off with short stories, but having done that now, I think I have great admiration for people who write short stories. So I think if you can write a short story, you can definitely write a book. No, I completely agree that that I think trying to keep all your ideas so compact, but still get a story across, that would be so difficult, I think. Oh, it was so hard. I'm, honestly, it was the hardest thing ever. And I was so pleased because the, the editor of the magazine came back and said, wow, we loved it. It was amazing. And I was thinking, oh, thank goodness, because I was actually really worried that I'd have to do it again or something. And I was like, well, how am I, I can't spare another four days to write 500, 600 words. 
Okay, going back to another audience question. Uh, it's actually from Liz. She's got two questions. So the first one is the title. Was this your first choice or did it evolve once the story uh, since Net Norman then became the main character? So it definitely wasn't um, the first title. And also, as, as anyone who's had a book published knows, will know, your title will probably change. That's why they call them working titles. Like I had a different title, which I won't say because some people might prefer it, but... No, that title was um, was bestowed on me by my editor in the UK. But the name, um, the name, you know, because I guess because Norman Foreman is, you know, it's it's it such, sounds funny. It's such a good joke. You you've got to exploit it, sort of thing. But I was a little bit miffed, not miffed, but a little bit worried at first because that was kind of like a it was a bit of a joke in the book. Like it was a bit of a dropping it in like when the first time that you found out his name was Norman Foreman I really liked that moment that that you had you'd been reading for a little while and then you were like what Norman Foreman how could you call a kid that and so so that that's kind of lost now but and I was I was like really it took me a little while to get used to the title and now I can't even imagine it it took me a second actually to remember what it was originally called um now I love it but I can't take credit for it Ah, oh, fair enough. What about the cover, though? Um, she wants to know, also the cover. How did you come up with the design, or did you, or the, completely the publisher? Yeah, oh my gosh, you have nothing to do with the covers. Like once you, once you, once you hand, well, they hand over a contract and you sign a contract. I mean, it becomes your book becomes everyone else's as well. And I was so terrified about the cover. Very excited, but terrified. And no, definitely, they they definitely. Um, you know, very kindly asked me, you know, various sort of open questions as to what I imagined. Or they asked me to actually, they asked me to point out some books that I felt, you know, how I'd imagine my cover might be. And I did that. Um, I was shocked when I saw it and, but I absolutely love it. And I can't even imagine it being anything else. But again, I there was no input from me, um, they, they definitely asked about colours and things like that, but it was after the design was done and they were definitely really receptive to trying other things. And I think I, I think there was something about the colour. I think we did it, we tried a couple of other like reverses of the teal colour and the cream colour, um, but it looks so fantastic on the shelf now. And I could walk into it. It does, the red, the red is so eye-catching and it's so perfect for the whole comedy and festival idea. You can picture that on the big, on the, on the stage. You so can, and those letters. That yes. The, the, I don't know if people can see it, but there, it's like a raised and embossed um, lettering. Yes. And the designer at Transworld in the UK, um, she created a whole Norman Foreman alphabet, like that's created from scratch. Wow, so that's lovely. great. So they've used it on other promotional material and stuff. But but yeah, I can walk in now to a bookshop and I can see it like standing out on the shelf a mile away so I guess that was I guess that was their purpose so they're a lot smarter than me over there but but yeah you, you really don't have you you know that you're consulted but to be honest it's a sales and marketing thing like your cover and and you've got to accept that and luckily I love it so I have heard stories of people not liking their covers but I'm not one of them well, I guess, you know, the author does their thing and the sales and marketing design team do their thing. So yeah. it's really important to let the experts do their job. I mean, they're not doing it to upset you if you if you get a colour you don't like on your cover. Yeah. So do you know if your book is being published in other languages or just English? No, it's being published in um, Dutch. I just was talking to my Dutch editor the other day. So it's being published in Dutch. It's being published in Hebrew in Israel, which is mind-blowing to me um, I can't wait to see that it's been sold in Italy so it's been published in Italian and German so wow far. are yeah. these all are these all countries you've uh you visited yourself as well maybe well except for Israel never been to Israel uh, well maybe it's an excuse to go absolutely I've always been always wanted to go to Israel so yeah I'm sure I'll have to now yeah and you could you could start creating a gallery of, of the book covers in the other languages. They must. I wonder if they're going to look the same. Have Have you seen the covers for the new for the alternate version? Well, or? the well, yeah, the the um the Dutch one and the German one are the same. Only their little thing is, you know, the I think Dutch translates to 
the big joke of Norman Foreman or something. I can't remember what the German one is. The American cover, because it's getting published in America as well, the American cover is totally different. I haven't got one here, otherwise I'd show you. Um, is completely different, but still great. It's blue and totally different. Um, and the Israel cover, I don't know what that's going to be yet. But they all do seem to be, apart from the US, they all do seem to be going for the same cover. Oh, that's good. Because, it's yeah, you're right. It's a great cover. Who wouldn't yeah. like that? Yeah. <laughs> oh, another question would be uh, writer's block. Did you deal with writer's block in your journey for this book? Or uh, what did you do if you did? I had another cup of tea, coffee, ate a chocolate. Um, Hibiscus tea? <laughs> yeah. No, um, I wish. Look. I just remember reading many years ago that uh, I think it was Stephen King maybe on his great book on writing that said there's no such thing as writer's block it's just another procrastination tool and I have so many of those in my back pocket procrastination tools that I don't need another one so I've always said there's no such thing as writer's block and to be honest because I write for my day job as well and there's I've, I've always dealing with deadlines and always dealing with long form copy like having to write you know 2000 words in a day's work or something like that I I don't even if I did believe in it <laughs> I don't get it because you just I've learned that if you just start sitting down and writing you know gobbledygook something will come and whether it's good whether it's bad whether you toss it the next day it's kind of irrelevant it's just really important to keep that momentum going so would that be your advice to to writers to just just write anything and have a set set kind of, uh, I guess, schedule or limit word limit that you, you want to try and accomplish for that day? Yeah, I mean, it works differently for different people. For me, a word, a word count works for me um, because Oh, sorry, everyone. <laughs> Looks like we had a, a small glitch there. Sorry about that. What was that, Julieta? Sorry, I said, yeah, for some people it's it's a word count and for other people it's um, it's a time thing. For me, it's a word count. So if I can do my 1,000 to 1,500 words in an hour, well, then off I go to a coffee shop after that. So <laughs> Well yeah. deserved, I'm sure. <laughs> but it is really important to, as they say, put your hands on it, touch it every day, whether you touch it and change you know, delete what you did yesterday. As long as you're in there, you've got to stay, you've got to stay focused because a couple of days away from it and it's really easy to lose focus. So there are a couple of questions we always try and ask our authors. And one of them uh, is, why do you love libraries? Oh, I think libraries are seriously the most fascinating places on earth. This book was written in a combination of Port Melbourne Library, the State Library in Victoria, um, the, I think I even did a little bit of it in the British Library in London, um, Twickenham Library in London. I just love libraries because they're like a little microcosm of community. Like there's, anyone can use, oh, I, I love them. I could go and see, well, I do, for, I was sitting in one all day today at the State Library in, in Melbourne. I just think they're a wonderful community place. It's more than just books. It's sort of the community because you see the same people, especially my local one. Um, it's just a wonderful place for people to sort of all come together and whether they're doing their resumes on the computer, whether they're reading a magazine, whether they've just come in to get out of the cold as, as a lot of people do. I think it's a safe, it's a, it's a really safe place and it's a lovely place. I've never, never found a library I didn't like. That's really good to hear yeah. on behalf of all the libraries uh, who are part of this. Yeah. And another question is Jane Eyre or Wuthering Heights? Wuthering Heights. Okay, good to know, good to know. I Just check. Yep, sorry. I hesitated there only to be polite, really. <laughs> There's no. Oh, I think, I think people have very fixed opinions. Yeah, love Wuthering Heights. Yep. I read it when I was about 10 years of age, actually. <laughs> okay, I'll just check. Okay, it doesn't look like anyone has any last minute questions. We're just uh, probably about to wrap up. Uh, I'd just like to say thank you, Julieta, for, for your time and for writing such a wonderful book. And any chance of any slight spoilers for the next book? What it might be about? Uh, what it might be set? Well, it's actually set also in the UK. Okay. And um, it's a family story. Mm -hmm. um, and 
it's it's actually a dual narrative again. It's very different to this, um, but I think people will walk away from it with the same feeling. So it's like hopeful. It's about finding hope and happiness in a you know a dark time and it's uplifting in the end. But there's a long way to get there. <laughs> uh, that way, but yeah. But I'm very excited about it. I'm really enjoying writing it, which again is a is a very good sign. So lucky. Well, that sounds good, and I'm sure we're all very eager to, to read it. So thank you all for attending this Author Talk event tonight. I'd like to say goodbye and uh, safe travels, and um, see you at the next talk. Thank Bye. Bye.